Okay, I'm gonna give this a second just to check that everything is working. Maybe start up my terminal and get my list of things ready to go. I like to just wait until YouTube gives me feedback and says um, that it is actually receiving my stream, which can usually take a couple of seconds. And there we go. It looks like everything's running okay. Let me know if it's not and um, we can dive right in. So basically I wanted to do a video series that helps you get up and running with the latest in the Quasar world. And since um, I don't really have the resources and time right now to create a dedicated series to this, I thought I'd try and cover basically as much as I could in a live stream. Uh, and then later on, we can turn it into something more robust because right now my focus is covering all of Quasar's components. So, um, which by the way, if you wanna check that out, then definitely head on over to GitHub and you wanna look at Quasar car slash takeoff. This is basically a really nice environment for learning. Um, and you can watch this video as well, which will give you more of an idea of what it is. But if you want to learn Quasar's components, basically you want to check out this repo. All right, but anyway, that's not what this video is about. So uh, first of all, when I want to talk about what I'm not going to be covering. I'm not going to be covering backends. There are so many different backends. Uh, later on, I'm going to be talking about some of the different ones, which is what I'm going to do here. Um, and I'm also not going to be talking about architecture because architecture, um, it just goes way beyond the scope of what I want to cover today. So basically we're going to build out like a bit of a, I guess like a bit of an admin panel. I don't really know how this is going to pan out. We're just going to do some coding. Um, but the main goal of this uh, video stream is to basically give you a good idea of how to get up and running with Quasar today with a lot of the more modern technologies. All right. So without further ado, let's get started. Let me just zoom in a little bit here. And now instead of saying Quasar create and then the name of the app, so for example, my dash app, um, you'll notice, and by the way, this is if you have the latest Quasar CLI. So if you don't have the latest version of the Quasar CLI, make sure you pull that in. You'll notice that this doesn't work anymore. It actually gives you a message telling you what to do now. So now we can just say yarn create Quasar. And that actually means that you don't even need the Quasar CLI any, at all to the best of my knowledge. So we're gonna go ahead and run that yarn create Quasar, yarn create. Quasar, and it's going to ask us a bunch of questions, and I'm going to show you the questions that you're likely to going to want to answer to. Now, Quasar UI Kit is if you want to create your own app extension. So if you're a more advanced user and you want to create an app extension um, that basically creates reusable functionality in Quasar, that's what that's about. Um, and that's for specifically for UI, so if you want to create your own Quasar component. Uh, AE here, App extension is for other stuff like tapping into Vite or Webpack and being able to do fancy stuff like that. Tapping into boot files, so basically installing view plugins, all of that kind of thing. You can extend Quasar with an app extension. And then this first option here is likely the one you want to choose where you're actually going to create a Quasar app. So I'll select that and let's call this um, Quasar Admin panel, I don't know. I don't even know if that's what it'll pan out to be, to be honest. Now, Quasar version two using Vue 3, that's most likely what you want to choose. If it's a very small chance that you want to choose this option and use Vue 2, so I only do that if you absolutely need to. We definitely want to use Quasar version two with Vue 3 under the hood. You can choose TypeScript if you like. Um, so I hit a, just so I can hit a wider audience, I'm going to choose JavaScript, though TypeScript is working really nicely with Quasar these days. Now you've got the choice between Webpack and Vite. Vite is currently in beta. Um, in my experience with it, it's surprisingly stable though. So I'm going to choose Vite. And chances are if you're watching this in the future, Vite is going to be stable. And you almost certainly want to use Vite unless there are some specific Webpack plugins that you want to use. So let's go to Vite. Um, package name, Quasar Admin Panel is what I'm going to choose. Um, project product name, I'm just going to leave that as the default description. This is all just like package.json stuff. Um, author, I'll leave that as the default. And we'll use SAS with SESS. Of course, you've got um, the other option of using SAS, um, the indented syntax, or no SAS at all. So if you don't want to use SAS, you just want to use plain CSS, you can go ahead and do that. But I'm going to use SAS with SESS. And now I can choose some of the options here. ESLint, you definitely want to use a lint up. There's a very small chance that you don't. So make sure that you've got ESLint selected. Um, state management, you can use Pina and Vuex. Uh, I probably should cover it at some point, but I don't think I'll have time in this video. If you want to learn how to use Pina or Vuex, and there are other videos out there for that, there really is no difference between using Pina in another project and using it in Quasar. Um, so if you want, you can choose Pina there, and Quasar is basically just going to do some scaffolding to get that up and running for you. Um, same with Vuex. Um, I use Vuex a lot only because I use a plugin called Vuex ORM, which gives me an ORM on top of Vuex. However, you're probably best off leaning more towards Pina um, for managing your data. And if you don't know what any of these two are, that's totally fine. You don't actually need to. 
And the other thing we have is Axios. That's just for making backend requests. Um, we probably won't need that. And even if I do use Axios, I usually just install that on my own manually. Um, and then for internationalization, you've got Vue I18N. So there we go. We're just going to choose ESLint in this example. And you've got the choice between PrettyR standard and Airbnb now. Now these are ESLint presets. PrettyR means that you're going to use PrettyR, which does a bit of extra formatting on top. Um, I don't like using PrettyR. I find that it gets in the way um, and I don't like a lot of the formatting that it does. However, a lot of people swear by it and love it. If you like PrettyR, then go ahead and use it. I'm just going to use standard, which is plenty for what I like to use in terms of a linter. Um, if you don't like, know what linting is, it's okay. You'll find out later on in this video. Now, it's gone ahead and set everything up. We're going to use Yarn now to go ahead and install those dependencies. And when they're done, whilst that's installing, I'll just run through what we're going to cover next. Oh, so what do all the getting started options mean? I did want to cover that. So if we go to quasar.dev and we go to the getting started section, you'll notice that there's a lot of Quasar flavors is what they're calling it. Now, if this overwhelms you, just choose the Quasar CLI option, okay? It's honestly, in, um, in most ways, it's better than any other options. These other options are only available really so that other people have a way into the Quasar world if they don't have the luxury of using Quasar CLI. So for example, if you want to gradually add Quasar into a project, you're going to use UMD slash standalone. Now that basically means that you can add it to the top of your project like it's showing here. So you're just adding in link and script tags and then you can go ahead and just basically start using Quasar in your app. So if you don't have a build set up and you want to start using Quasar, that's why you would use UMD slash standalone. There's no other reason really you would use that. It's more like to make Quasar more progressive. So if somebody wants to gradually add Quasar into their project, they can. Or if someone's stuck in a world where they can't use a build process, then you've got UMD slash standalone. Then you've got the Vite plugin. Now this has caused a little bit of confusion. You've got the Quasar CLI plugin for Vite, and then you've got the Vite plugin. So Quasar CLI basically means that you're going to be able to export to all the different platforms and Quasar can do a whole bunch of work for you in terms of like building your app and um, you know all sorts of cool stuff like that. Whereas with the V, and they've got like a little table on the page that shows you, uh, I don't know where it is, it's probably somewhere else. Here we go, that that shows you the differences between them all. But basically, um, the V plugin means if you already have a V project up and running, or if for some reason you need to use it as a V plugin, then you can basically add Quasar to an existing V project. Okay, so if you have a Vite project, you can now inject Quasar into that project. That's what the Vite plugin is. Now for Quasar CLI, the, it's got a Vite option. Okay, you've got the choice between uh, Webpack and Vite. Um, and that is slightly different. Like I said before, that means that Quasar as a CLI tool can give you a whole lot of extra features on top of Quasar and basically help you get started a lot faster. It is kind of hard to explain the differences between these um, without going further into it. I recommend that you just use the Quasar CLI um, with Vite. It is beta at the moment, but I'd start with that and then go into, um, yeah, stable. Uh, and then, um, you know, it, it'll, be, it'll be stable uh, soon enough. Uh, so what else have we got? Then we've got the Vue CLI plugin. So I know that there's, there's a lot of options here. Basically the Vue CLI plugin, um, uh, Vue first had Vue CLI and then Vue, uh, Evan created Vite. Okay, so Vue CLI is um, basically a Webpack tool that makes it easy to work with Vue and like add um, plugins into Vue. Um, using Webpack under the hood. So you can almost think of it as like Vue CLI is Webpack, Vite is, um, yeah, well, Vite. So this is just another way of doing it. If you already have a Vue CLI project and you need to use um, Quasar, then that's why we have a Vue CLI option available as well. So I know this was a little bit long-winded. Basically, at the end of the day, try and go for the Quasar CLI if you can. If you must, um, use either the Vite plugin or Vue CLI plugin. If you really have no choice and you don't have a build process, then go to UMD slash standalone. Okay, so this should all be um, done by now. Hang on, let me just get organized here. And it looks like it is. So now we're going to CD into our application and we're going to open that in code. So we give that a second to run. And I'll zoom in a little bit here. Somebody said to me the other day, it's not zoomed in enough. I don't want to zoom in too far because I actually think it makes a worse experience, at least in my um, experience as a learner. So I think this should be enough, but let me know if that's not zoomed in enough for you. Um, 
Now, the next thing I've got e on the list is changing the layout. So a lot of the, the thing that a lot of people want to do, actually, let's just start by going Quasar Dev. So that's going to start our dev server now when we run Quasar Dev. And we'll just jump out of full screen here. All right, so that's um, our dev server up and running and we're ready to start developing. And oh, what was I about to talk about? Yeah, so a lot of people want to know how to change the layout here. By default, you get this little... um button that then opens up that left menu and you might want to have like another button here or like a footer down here and in order to do that Quasar has a really cool tool so we go to tools here and then you jump into the layout builder then basically you can change the layout using the options here so we can say like I want a header yes I want a footer let's get rid of the footer option so that removes that footer at the bottom there um, I want a left side drawer. Let's keep that in and let's get rid of the right side drawer. Um, navigation tabs here, if you want to have them, maybe we'll actually keep those in. And what else have we got? Configuring layout parts. So that's basically the details of how all of this sort of interacts. Um, I'll give you an example. If we choose, basically, you can just play around with these options to get them how you like them. So, you know, if you choose this option here, then it means that the left drawer takes up a little bit of extra space. Um, another thing you can do is choose the capital letter L there versus the lower cap. Oh, I can't remember what these all do. I did a whole video on them, but honestly, I forget what they all do. But this is a really powerful way to build out a layout. And you can check out my layout video if you want more information on that. Um, but I think I'm waffling a little bit here. So let's click on export layout now. And basically, we can just copy this file, jump back into Quasar. And if we go to source layouts, we can grab that default layout that we have and just replace it with this one. So there we go, I've gone ahead and saved that. And now we've got that new layout up and ready to go. Now, obviously these tabs don't do anything yet, which is why I'm getting a blank page there. But um, let's just check we don't have any um, console problems and it looks like we don't. And so, yeah, you get the idea. That's how you can basically build out the layout that you want. Just jump onto this page, play around with it and get it to look exactly how you want it to look. Okay, so let's close out of that now and move on to the next thing, which is routing. All right, so maybe we can make it so that page one, page two, page three, for example, is going to show a different page on here. That's probably a good thing to tackle next. All right, so the first thing to do is probably to um, set up the routing for those pages. So we'll jump into router and we'll jump into routes.js. And basically we wanna say, we wanna create a page for page one. So how about we come in here and we create another option here. I might just close out that menu. And I like to organize this a little bit differently. I like to have it spaced out a little bit more. I think it's easy to look at. There we go. And let's basically just copy paste that down and say, if you go to the path of one, then I want you to take me to pages slash, and we'll call this one page. All right, and we'll build that component in a second. And we'll do the same for the other ones, two and three. So then we've got two page and we've got three page and we'll change that to two and we'll change that to three. All right, so basically what we're saying here, if you go to the path of slash, right, which basically means nothing slash, then we're going to be using the main layout. All right, that's the layout we're going to use, this main layout. Then if you go to um, slash nothing, all right, which is this page here, we're going to inject this page, the index page into that layout. So this part that you're seeing in here, that's the index page. So this is the layout, the thing that we pasted in before. That's kind of the skeleton, all of this around the outside. And now this index page here is the part in the center. All right, so now if we go to one, we're basically saying, I want you to take this one page here and inject it into the center, all right? Now that shouldn't work because I haven't actually created those pages yet. So let's go ahead and create those pages. And you can do that, if I open up another terminal here, by saying, Quasar, uh, I believe it's new page, and we'll call this one page. And then we'll do another one for two page, two page, and I'll do another one for three page, three page. All right, now one more thing that I wanna point out here is, uh, I said that this is the layout, the skeleton of the outside, and then um, since this is sitting within its children, that means it gets injected into that component. How does it get injected into there? Well, if we jump into main layout, so I'm gonna control click that to jump into there and scroll up. See how it says router view here? 
that's the part that gets injected into the center. So if I comment this out, notice that nothing shows up. Router view is basically saying, hey, this is where I want you to spit out. If I come back here, that's where I want you to spit out this component. All right, so now let's jump into one page. Uh, actually, no, we'll go back to the main layout here. And now we need to link this up to go to uh, those locations. So here we go. This is this here, our QRoute tab is basically that page one. And then same with the other one here is page two. And I believe we made it. If I go control P back to my routes. Yeah, we just made it the words one, two, and three. Control P back again. So let's change that to one and two and three. Let's see if that works. All right, so we're getting some sort of an error. I'll just do a quick refresh here. Can it read properties of undefined reading file? All right, so it looks like I've done something wrong. I might just close the Vite server out and start it up again, just in case it's a problem with the dev server. Okay, yeah, there we go. It looks like I just needed to restart the server. And it looks like that's working, but now we need to actually put some content in there. So how about we go to page uh, one page. In fact, I'll show you that in the file menu. So to get there, I went to source pages. And when we created that page before, it showed up here in one page. And now let's just spit something out here, one page, save it. And there we go. Now it shows up in there. So that's how we're basically easily able to hook up these links here to an actual page. And by doing it in this way, by using this QRoute tab component, so if I go back to the layout, this QRoute tab component, that means that we can essentially refresh the page and it takes us back to one page. If I go to page two and refresh the page, it takes us back to two page. So this is going to link up the current page that is selected in that route tab with the route itself. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Anyway, let's move on to the next thing. So that's routing covered. Let's uh, do an introduction to the composition API with script set up. All right, let me show you what I actually mean by that. So if we go to one page now, notice that we've got this export default section here. Um, what we can do here is say setup. For those of you that aren't familiar with script setup, I'm going to get, sorry, um, the composition API, I'll give you a really, really quick rundown. Uh, so let's set this to um, a variable. So we'll say pre tag there. And we'll say my um, var. And then we're going to say const my var is equal to ref. And the reason we're saying ref is that's Vue's way of basically saying I want this to be a reactive variable. And then we'll say um, some message here. Uh, and then what we have to do is return my message. So what's happening here is I'm saying, hey, I want to create a my var variable which is a reactive reference to this string here, some message, okay? So this is how you create a reactive variable using the composition API, okay? So if you're using the um, options API in the past, this is just like using um, the data property. So it's just like doing this, saying data, return, and then saying uh, my var is equal to some message, right? These are essentially the same thing, okay? But there's a few benefits here which are going to start revealing themselves. And what we have to do with the composition API is we have to do this return statement here. And this is basically saying, hey, I want this variable to be available on the template, okay? So anything returned here is now available on the template up there, all right? And that's why it now shows up here as um, some message. And now what we can do is we can say q-input, so this is Quasar's input component, v-model, so we're going to model my var here. And now if I type something in there, it changes um, that message up there. So it's reactive, okay? So that's what we mean by ref. If we didn't make it a ref, then it would not be reactive. So let's do that. And we need to comment that out. And now if I change this, it's no longer reactive. All right, so that's why we use the word ref there. That's that's what's making it reactive. Now, another thing we have is computed properties. Um, and I'm going to use like a really silly contrived example just to get this out of the way and show you quickly. Computed um, example is equal to 
and I will do a proper composition API video at some point. Now we can say my var dot value. So that's the next thing. When you're using the composition API, inside of setup, you can't just refer to my var. You have to refer to it as my var dot value if you want to look at that value or change it. All right, in the template, we don't have to. We can just say my var and behind the scenes, it says my var dot value. However, inside of the template, we have to say my var dot value um, is equal to something else. Um, but sorry, this is a computer property. So now we can say return my var dot value plus um, more text. And now let's take that computed example and we need to pull computed out of view. So I've just imported that and we'll import that directly from view. Now we've exposed it on the template. That's what we've done here. And now let's go ahead and just spit it out in a pre-tag there. All right, so some text and then more text. So basically it's just added on this more text part here. And that's also going to be reactive. All right, so that's how you do computed props using the composition API. Um, the other thing is if you, want, if you want to use methods, you can just do them directly in here. So we can say, for example, um, change to um, change to Luke to change it to my name. And let's make that a function. So function change to Luke. And now what we can do is say my var dot value is equal to Luke. And now we'll expose that here. Notice how linter is yelling at us. It's helping us. It's saying, hey, you're not even using this function. That's a problem. Make sure you actually use the functions that you define there. Okay, so now we've got this function change Luke and we'll just have a button here, Q dash button. And then we'll say at click and we're going to call that change to Luke function. And Quasar's buttons can have a label, so we can say here, change to Luke. And now I'm going to click on that, and it changes the text to Luke. All right, so that's how you do methods with the Composition API. It's, it's actually, when you get used to the Composition API, you'll love it because it's very much just JavaScript. It takes you out of this fancy world of the Options API where some stuff is happening that feels a little bit, um, uh, I guess like unflexible whereas you get this extra flexibility with the composition api where you can start like moving things into different files really easily but anyway i digress so i think that's about it there are a couple of things other things like dealing with props but i'm going to save that for later on that is the crux of using the composition api you just have refs um, where you define um, your, your variables like this you have computed properties, very similar to using the options API. But now I wanna show you how to make this, um, this syntax even nicer. So what we can do is instead of using uh, setup here, we can come up here and say script and then the word setup. And that means that we can actually get rid of all of this code here. So this export default setup, we can get rid of that. I'll save it. Um, we can get rid of return because when you use script setup, um, basically it does some stuff behind the scenes to notice what you have defined here. So for example, this function change to Luke, um, without returning it now, it's going to notice that we have this function and automatically make it available on the template for us. Okay, so it does that for us behind the scenes. And now our code looks a whole lot nicer and it still works. All right, so this is what we mean by script setup. Script setup basically allows us to get rid of that export default. So instead of going export default, setup, and then doing everything inside of there, um, and instead of then returning everything inside of here, we can get rid of all of that code and just do it flat inside of script. It's really, really nice way to code um, using, using Quasar and using Vue 3. So this is a Vue 3 feature. This isn't a Quasar thing. This is a Vue 3 thing. Any Vue 3 app um, with a compiler is going to allow you to do this. Uh, all right. So that's about it for um, for that. Int that's an introduction to the Composition API. Now, the next thing I have on my list is building a basic uh, login page. So how about we make this page one uh, a login page? So I'm going to jump into my layout, main layout, and then we're going to change this from one to login and then let's call this login there we go so now we've got login showing up there but that link will no longer work because we now need to change the route that it's going to so we go to router routes 
and we say, hey, router, if you go to slash and then login, I want you to take me to one page. But let's actually change that to login page. And then I'm going to jump into pages, one page, I'll right click and I'll say rename and call that login page now. And I might need to shut my server down. A lot of this stuff is probably going to be fixed soon with the VCLI plugin. So that's just a couple of tiny things like that that might not um, work straight out until some of those bugs are ironed out. So now we can go to the login page and there we go, it shows up. So let's get rid of all of this and start from scratch. This is gonna be good practice. And inside of this Q page, I'm gonna have a Q dash card and I'll just show you what that looks like. Oh, we've got nothing in it. So you need to have some stuff in it. A Q card is just a very, very basic component that gives you a shadow on the bottom um, and gives you kind of like that cardy sort of feel. And now we can say inside of here, Q dash card dash section. So a section inside of the card, which is going to add a little bit of padding in there. So you can say here, for example, content and notice we get that extra padding now. And what I wanna do is give this a maximum width. So width, so I'll say style is equal to max dash width. And I reckon about 600 pixels is probably good for uh, a login form. Let's see what that looks like. That's probably too much to be honest. How about we go like 450? There we go. So it's put a bit of a width on that. I want this to be in the center of the page. So what we can actually do is say the class is equal to and use, we can now use some of Quasar's utility classes, which it gives us out of the box. And we can say, hey, I want this to be flex and then flex dash center. This is a really, really nice way to just center something on the page. Now notice that it's lost the width there. If you want it to still take up that full width, so that maximum width that we've got, we can add a class on this card called full width. All right, so these, these patterns that I'm showing you right now, flex, flex center, full width, and then having a max width on a card, this is really common. I do this kind of thing all the time. This is a really good pattern to know. All right, so let's turn this into a login card. How about we say, log in there, you might want that to be centered. So we've got some utility classes for that. Class is equal to text dash center. And now that login text is centered. I'm also gonna say style is equal to font dash size 1.3 EM. Yeah, for basic stuff like this, I actually use the style tag uh, quite a bit. I know a lot of people don't like the style tag. Um, do what you like. If you'd rather just do this in pure CSS, that's totally fine. For simple things like this um, that are one-liners, I'm totally fine with using a style tag. I actually find it easier. Now, one thing that's annoying me right now is I don't like this layout. I want all of this to be on new lines. And this is the quote unquote view way of doing things. You usually have, when there's more than one property on, you usually have those on new lines. So what we can do is make our ES lint a little bit stricter. So our linter is gonna be a bit stricter and automatically put those onto new lines for us. So let's go to eslintrc.js. And what I'm going to do is comment out view three essential. So that gives us basic linting. Um, and we're gonna change that to view three recommended. And if you don't know what linting is, what it basically does is checks for errors in your code um, and catches them for you. All right, so see these little yellow underlines? That's saying, hey, this should be on a new line. That's why it's giving us that little squiggly. But one of the cool things about ESLint, if I save this file now, it can automatically fix those problems for us. It's a really nice way to develop. So now what I can do is basically cross this out, cross that out and put all of this on one line. So you can just write your code in one line like that. You don't have to worry about formatting or spacing. And then when you save it, it automatically formats it for you. Now, you do need to go into the Quasar docs. So we go to the Quasar docs here, getting started guide. Uh, you'll notice there's a section on VS Code configuration. If you haven't done it yet, you definitely, definitely want to run through this VS Code configuration option um, menu in the docs, all right? So make sure you go ahead and do that. Uh, if this, you know, automatically, if saving the file doesn't automatically um, lint it for you, it's probably because you need to do follow this guide in here. Uh, okay, so anyway, let's move on to the next thing. Uh, login page, we're going to need uh, an import. Let's add another section here, q-card-section. And inside of there, we'll have a q-import. And then let's set a label of that import equal to name. All right, or it's probably more likely to be something like email. So there we go, we've got an email import ready to go. I don't like the styling for that, but we'll fix it in a moment. And then another one we've got here is, um, we'll probably have password. So that's a really classic login form where you've got an email and password. 
and then you'll usually have a button at the bottom. And what I like to do is I like to put the button at the bottom outside of the card section, because remember the card section adds padding, and add a Q button here, and say the label is equal to login, something like that. And then I'll give that a class equal to full dash width. Notice that it takes up the full width now. And then I'll give the, a color equal to primary. All right, I think that looks really nice for the button, how it sort of takes up the full width at the bottom. Now, another thing I'll point out that if you wanna change what this primary color is, so basically the styling of your application, then you can jump into this CSS directory in here and then go to um, quasar variables. Uh, .scss, and you can change basically the default styling of your app. This is a really good way to get up and running just for um, basic styling of your application, giving it a primary and secondary color. And usually in my apps, I like to keep styling very, very simple. Unless you have a designer, I highly recommend just having a primary, secondary, and accented color. I wouldn't actually change anything else. I wouldn't go too fancy with styling unless you really know what you're doing in terms of creating a, a styled UI. All right, so you might like come in here, for example, and change that to, I don't know, let's go to a nice bluey color like that, or aqua, whatever you call that. And let's set the accent. I'm probably breaking some material design rules here at the moment, but that's okay. <laughs> and then a secondary color, and let's save that. And notice it in a second, that's gonna change sort of the whole look and feel of our site, which is really nice. All right, so, there we go. So the color of that equal to primary. I don't like this little sort of underline type form. I like it sometimes, but I don't think it looks good in the login form. So another one we can use is filled here. So let's set filled for both of those inputs. Whoops, filled. There we go. Notice they're not spaced out very nicely. So Quasar gives us this really nice class called Q. So in other words, Quasar, put a margin on the bottom and I want you to make it a medium size margin. And there we go, we get a medium size margin on the bottom. My phone just went off, so I'm quickly going to check what that is. It's a message from my mother. She tried to call me. <laughs> All right, we'll leave that for now. Now that I've done this, um, it looks like it is actually a little bit too wide still. So let's change that from 450 to 400. There we go. I'd probably even go a little bit um, less in terms of the width, maybe 370. And I think that looks good. If I put the password in, you can actually see everything there. So let's change this to type is equal to password. And that means that as we type in the password, nobody will be able to see it if they're looking over somebody's shoulder. Now, just to be, um, give you a little bit more info here, we can change it from filled to outlined. That's another option that we have. So it's kind of a nice effect as well. And another one that we have is borderless. This is really good inside of tables. So if you want to basically take out um, most of the styling, you can change that to borderless. All right, so let's bring that back to filled. I think filled is really nice in this example. And the next thing we might wanna do is model that. So you imagine you wanna actually model some data here and then when you press login, it's going to actually use the email and password to hit your back end and log the user in. So let's have a look at what that might look like. We'll come in here and we'll say const form is equal to a ref and we're going to press tab to import ref there. And let's make the form have an email. It'll be an empty string by default and a password, which will also be an empty string by default. Now we can come up here, and for the email, we can say v-model is equal to form.email, and then we'll do the exact same thing for the password, which is equal to form.password. So now I can type my email in, and my password, but it does look like that's not working. So let's just try restarting the server again. Yeah, it looks like something went wrong at some point there. And close that out, and now it's working. So there you go. And then of course what you probably do is you'd say function, uh, login, you might make this an async function, and then when the user tries to log in, you will then use the form.value, because remember you have to say form.value um, when you're inside of, um, uh, inside of a script setup or when you're using the composition API. And basically you'd say like, um, axios.post and then you go to your login endpoint and then you'd post the data which might be just the form.value. All right, you get the idea. This is um, something that goes beyond the scope of this video. So for now, we'll simply say uh, console.log form.value and I'll grab login there and we'll say at click for the button. So when you click on that button, I want you to call that login function. Let's open up the console here and then put in some information there. 
and we can see that it is working now. You've got the email and you've got the password. Cool. All right, so that is a pretty good start. What else can we do? Uh, so that, I think that's the login page done. And I've shown you some basic components. So you've seen the Q button component now. Um, by the way, Quasar is not pulling in all of these components by default. By default, it actually pulls in no components. And it's automatically going to notice that you're using Q button and then pull it in to make sure that you maintain a very small bundle size. So I think that does confuse some people. They think they're going to end up with a massive file size because they're using Quasar. Not true at all. It only pulls in the components. Um, the components that are actually used there. Okay, so that's the login page. Now I quickly want to cover choosing a um, choosing a backend, and I've talked about a couple of the options here. Uh, and look, it's I'm just I'm just going to breeze over these and just give you a quick idea of what some of these backends do, and then make some recommendations basically based on um you know what you might be trying to accomplish with a backend. Now for backends where you need a lot of control. Um, running things on your own servers, um, and you need something that's like a lot more robust, then I'd recommend something like Laravel. Uh, Laravel is something that I've used in the past. Um, I love this framework, and it's a PHP backend. So if you're familiar with PHP, uh, then that might be a good place to, um, a good one to check out. Uh, the one that I'm actually currently using at work at the moment is Strappy, and it allows you to get it up and running a lot faster than Laravel does because it gives you a nice interface for adding fields. And but it still keeps you in control of the backend, so it's still a backend that you run on your own servers, okay? And Strappy is actually built on top of something called Koa, and you might know about ExpressJS. Koa is um, basically the predecessor. Predecessor? What's the word? Um, anyway, there was ExpressJS, and then um, and then Koa. So that's definitely something worth checking out, and it's kind of like a lower level uh, backend that mostly does things like handling middleware and um, giving you uh, some basic functionality for building out a backend. It's less opinionated than something like Strappy. Uh, the other um, frameworks in this category, if you want to jump into the node world, would be, I should throw these over here, uh, something like uh, Nest.js. So this has a very modular system. I haven't done a lot of experience, I haven't got a lot of experience with Nest.js, but definitely um, check that out if you're considering a more robust node type backend. Um, then you've got something like a Donus JS. So if you have experience with Laravel, but you need to use a node-based backend, you might want to check out a Donus JS. It's basically a Laravel clone in JavaScript. Really interesting project. So Nest.js and a Donus JS, you might want to check both of those out if you want a robust backend um, building experience. Now, as for backends that you don't actually build out yourself, so ones that are kind of self-managed, you just say what the data is, and then the back end is kind of built out for you and you don't need to manage servers or anything like that. Um, we've got Firebase and Superbase. So Firebase, a lot of you have probably heard of. This is a Google product and it makes it really easy to basically get a back end up and running fast. Um, and it, yeah, it makes it really easy to kind of interact with nested data with a back end. Superbase is something that was built um, to kind of, uh, what would you call it? I guess it's a competitor of Firebase, but it's using Postgres under the hood. It's a very interesting project. And I would actually steer people more towards Superbase. If you're already using the Google Suite, you might want to check out Firebase. Um, but I think Superbase is a much more interesting um, po project. It feels more modern to me. It's using Postgres um, on the back end. It actually deals, to the best of my knowledge, it actually deals directly with Postgres, which gives you some pretty insane speeds. Um, and it does some really interesting things with like live data, and it makes it really easy to set up your data um, manually, uh, sorry, set up your data and then have like relationships and that kind of stuff uh, set up for you so you can easily then retrieve that data from the front end. So if you wanna get up and running fast, these two guys, if you wanna get up and running um, fast but you need more control over the back end, then you might wanna check out these two or Laravel, especially if you're like experienced in the PHP world or even Strappy, which is kind of a more, um, Takes, a, takes on a lot of the responsibility for working for, uh, for, with models for you. If you want to go a little bit more low level, then check out something like Coa or maybe even Express. Or if you want to go super low level, then you might want to check out Node um, itself. Like, um, But chances are you already know, if you are watching this video and you already know what 
uh, and you want to use something like Node, then you already know what you're doing anyway. All right, I'm talking about this too much. So that's a quick overview of choosing a backend, back a loaded topic. Uh, what have we got here? About backend, I'm a big fan of Laravel and thought about switching to Adonis, so being able to share some parts between front and back. Yeah, I think the Adonis is a very, very interesting project, um, and I would be tempted to use it if I were to you know, go into the backend world again um, for, uh, for Node.js. But I have to use Strapi because that's what the work is using. But to be honest, I'm really liking Strapi more and more, um, especially since I can jump into the lower level stuff with Koa. Okay, moving on. So I want to show you some other cool components. Uh, oh no, hang on. Let's just jump to this part here. I've kind of like screwed up the order now. I wanted to show you basically building a users table, what that might look like, because this is a kind of a common problem. But first, let's just build up a little bit of a menu on the left side here so that we can actually click on, for example, a user's option, something that you'd often see in a CMS. So we'll jump into our main layout. All right. Now, notice we've got a lot of these yellow squigglies. That's because we updated our linter. If I just save the file now, my linter is automatically going to lay that out in a really nice way. Um, for me. By the way, notice we're not using script setup here. So I'm going to say setup. I can get rid of all of that. I can get rid of all of that. Um, I can get rid of the return statement here. And whoops, I got rid of one too many brackets. And I'm going to turn this into a const toggle draw function is equal to that function. There we go. So notice that script setup really does make things a whole lot cleaner. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and create a menu. And I want to try and do this the right way. So let's go full screen here because we're going to go a little bit more code heavy now. Um, all right, so where's our menu? If we come down here, so this is our draw. The draw is that left menu that you see within our application. And so what I'm going to have here is a Q-list. But what you might want to do is actually create a new component for this. So I'm going to say Control Shift P Reveal. This is a really quick way to basically reveal in your left panel the current component that you're on. And I'm going to create a new file here, and I'm just going to call it um, Main Layout Menu Dot View. And I've got a really nice snippet here for a template that I like to have by default. Let's go back into the main layout. Here it is here, and we're going to use this um, main layout. What did I call it? Yeah, main layout menu. Actually, I'm going to change that name to main layout uh, menu list because I always like the last word in my components to match up with the Quasar component, and we're going to be using the Q list component. So that's why instead of saying main layout menu, I say main layout menu list because it makes it clear to me and other developers that this is going to be a list component. All right, so that's why I've done that. And now let's just make this a Q dash list, and I'm just going to put some random text in there just to see if this is working. And now instead of a Q list there, we're going to make that our main layout menu list all right so that should have been auto imported let's double click that and scroll up i like to just test if it was and there we go that was auto imported for me if that's not auto importing you might want to check out vola which is a extension for visual studio code that just makes it really nice um, dealing with view code all right there we go so we've got our main layout menu list let's see if that's working and there we go we can see it showing up at the top there <laughs> looks like nothing uh, to begin with. So let's come back here. We'll jump into this component and start building out our main layout menu list. By the way, this is something you want to do a lot. You don't want to put everything into one big component. You want to try and break your components apart into smaller um, chunks like we've done here. So let's call this a Q dash item. So inside of a Q list, you can have a Q item. And then inside of a Q item, you can have a Q dash item dash section. All right, and there's a reason that this is deeply nested, all right? There's a reason it has to go list, item, item section. It gives us some really nice flexibility because it means we can have a section on the left of the item. That's, for example, one. And then if we add another section in here that says two, and I'll save that, um, jump out of full screen. Let's have a look at that. It just makes it space out really nicely. And then you can do some really nice stuff by saying, hey, I want this section to be on the side and then it just throws that section onto the side. And just, it's a really nice way to help you lay out your items. 
um, which is why we've got this queue item section rather than throwing it directly inside of a queue item. So hopefully that made sense. I just wanted to give you a little bit of context as to why we have to do that deep nesting of the components here. All right, so we can also come up here and make the item clickable. And that basically means when I hover over this, we're going to get that little link um, showing up. Or we can even say to, to say, hey, uh, this is going to take you to the users page. All right, so if I hover that, it's still going to be clickable because two um, basically automatically adds that sort of clickability styling to it. And now if I click on here, it takes us to the user's route, which of course doesn't exist yet. All right, so that's it. That's pretty much how we can very easily make a menu. And then you might have up here another item. So Q-item and then a Q-item-label. And then you can say here, this is our menu. Right, just to add a little label there. In fact, I want, think I want to wrap that in a queue item section. So let's cut that and say queue dash item dash section. Throw that in there. And there we go. That's just made the styling a little bit nicer. All right, so let's change this from one to users. Um, and I just know that people are going to want to know how to style this a little bit more. So let me just quickly show you here. You can say class is equal to, I don't know, background primary. And then you could say text dash white to make the text white. And that's a way that you might like want to style that differently. You know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of different things you can do in terms of styling here. Um, but I might just bring that back to our original example. There we go. All right, so we've now got a user's menu, takes us to a page that doesn't exist. So we now, to, now need to make that page. First of all, let's come in here and say, oh, I know this is hard to view, but... Um, I'll speak it as I write it. Oh, this isn't letting me grab the menu bar there. My VS Code is messing up. Anyway, I'm, I'm writing here Quasar new page. And let's call it users page. All right, so now that's created a new blank page for us. So we'll jump into users page. And we'll come in here and say script setup. We'll get rid of export default. And I actually like my script setup to be at the top. So let's do that. And then we'll say users page here. And what else do I want to do? Now I need to do the routing for that. So we'll go router, routes, and then we'll create another page. And I'm just going to copy that one. And we'll call this users because remember the link took us to users. And that's going to take us to pages slash users page. Save that. And there we go. Now we've got our users page. So now I can click on these different menu items. They all work. Or I can go to the menu and click on users and that takes us to the users page. So hopefully you're seeing there's a lot of different ways that we can basically manage um, menus when we're using Quasar. And notice by the way that Quasar automatically makes that highlighted for us when it's selected. So if I select login, notice that the color of it is black. But when I click on that, notice the color of it is now that kind of um, bluey aqua color that we chose. All right, so the users page is going to be a table. I'm just going to do an example table for you to show you what that looks like. Control, uh, by the way, to do that, I said Control P, and then I searched for users page. That's just a quicker way to, uh, to sort of jump around your editor. And now I can come in here and say Q dash table. And let's go ahead and start building out a table now. So we're going to need some dummy data for this table. So let's say const data is equal to and since this is not going to be reactive, I'm not using a backend or anything, I don't need to say ref here. I can just give it an array straight up. So now let's give it some objects and I'll say name is equal to Luke Debol. That's my name. Email is equal to Luke at, uh, let's use my Quasarcast one, Quasarcast.com. And you can imagine this would probably have an ID as well. So let's say the ID is equal to one. And I'll do a couple of others. One for my dog, one for my other dog, and one for my other dog. <laughs> we have two chihuahuas, sorry, three chihuahuas at the moment. All right, so this first one, I'll just sort of zoom through these. We've got Panda, we've got Lily, and then we've got Min Min. I might do Min Dash Min. Yeah, that looks better. And now I can say Min Min, and we can do Lily, and we can do Panda. So there we go, we've got all of the data for the users page. Now ESLinter is being helpful and saying, hey, 
you have a data object, but you're not actually using it. So go ahead and do something with that data, um, data array. So now we can come down here and say, hey, table, I want you to have some rows, and those rows are going to be equal to that data that I have. So let's refresh the page to see if that works. And there we go. By default, it actually automatically figures out a lot of stuff for us. But we want to have a little bit more control over these rows, so let's go ahead and see how we can do that. We can say const columns is equal to, and we'll make that an array of objects, and let's say field, so the field for one of these columns is going to be equal to um, name, and the name of that is going to be equal to name, and I think that's all we need to begin with. I don't have the docs up, so I'm doing all of this from memory. Let's see if that works out for me. <laughs> Save it. All right, so there we go. Notice now that we just get the columns for the name. And now we can do some other stuff like align, and we can align that to the left. There we go. And I think we can give it a title. I can't remember how to do the title, to be honest. So let's come over here. Um, this is useful, though. Uh, if you want to find out more about how Quasar works under the hood, this is really, really valuable to know. So if you're kind of like haven't been listening very closely so far, listen right now. If you go to the Quasar docs and have a look at the API Explorer, um, that link isn't working. I might need to refresh the page here. I think the docs just updated. Yeah, here we go. The API Explorer gives you access to all of Quasar's API cards, which is insanely, insanely helpful. So I can t come in here and say Q table. And there we go, I've got all the information I need to know about the queue table component. And you'll notice if we click on this docs menu here, and we go to the queue table component, every component gets this little card at the top that gives you full access to the API. If you can understand how to use this card, it is insanely, insanely helpful. So definitely go ahead and check that out. All right, so coming back here, uh, we're using a prop and it was the column prop. So I can even come in here and say, columns because that's the name of the prop that i'm trying to use so here it is here columns name we can give it a label that's the one that i was looking for so let's come back to vs code and now i can say the label of this comma column is equal to and i'll just throw that over there name and there we go we got the name of that column so this is now giving us a little bit of extra control over that column we might want to display the id so if we want to do that, we can just say that the field is equal to ID, the name is equal to ID. I think technically you don't actually need the name. That's for other things like when you want to start using slots. That's how you identify it inside of a slot. That's why we have that name field. Um, all right, now let's just change this to ID. And there we go. And we have total flexibility now. So you might want to say instead of email, you can say like primary email is the label here. The field of that is equal to email. And maybe we want, we want to al align that to the right. Gosh, can't get my sentences out right now, can I? <laughs> and this one, you might want to align center. Usually with numbers, you want to align things centered. Mm, actually, I think it looks better with left in this scenario. There we go, so you've got the primary email. Um, and honestly, I'd probably align all of these to the left. Uh, that's looking good. Now, just to show you a little bit more of what you might want to do here to get um, some more control, uh, field can actually be a function. So instead of returning a string field, which basically says, hey, I want you to grab the field out of the object data, we can change this to a function. All right, so you can pull out the row in that function and then say row dot email. And notice that gives us the same thing, but now you can have more control over it. All right, so if you wanted to just append something to that, uh, in fact, maybe you do something like this, email, this is a terrible example. I don't know why you do it because it's redundant. But the point I'm trying to make is that you have total control over the display of this value. Um, and you can actually come in here and change the uh, what sits inside of that cell as well. And I don't want to go too much into this, otherwise this video will be too long. But I can, for example, if I undo all of that, I can come in here and use a slot. And I can't remember the name of the slot, so I'm going to come over here to the API Explorer. And we're going to look for the slot section, and it's called cell something. So let's scroll down here. You got body cell, which allows you to access every single individual cell. Or if I scroll down, what else have we got? Body cell, and then the name of that cell. Remember how I said the name property is important for identifying the name when you're using slots? 
So let's come in here and also add in name for all of these. Now I probably should tell you what I'm actually doing here. What I'm actually doing is I'm showing you how to access each individual cell so you can put components in the cell itself. All right, this is really cool. I think you're gonna love it. So now I can come in here and then say template. Ah, there's something crawling on me. We've got, we got ants in this house. And then we wanna use the slot that is called body cell and then the name of this cell which is, let's do the email one to begin with, email. All right, so just to show you what this looks like, I can now create a div called email cell, and notice that it's taken over this cell here. So what we can do now is we can say q-td, right, because Quasar's got its own table data, so that we get all the table data styling, and there you go. Next, you can pull in, you can pull the props out of there, and then proxy those props down like this, and that basically means that um, all the styling and all the extra details related to a cell is going to be proxied to the cell itself. So if you do other things like hiding the cell, so let's just say, um, I think it's called, is it called hidden? Yeah, and let's say hidden is equal to um, email here. Is that gonna work? Ah, oh, I think, it, hang on. I wanna show you this because I think it's important. Um, no, visible, that's what the word is. Yeah, here we go. You can say visible columns here. So visible dash columns. And I wanna say, hey, only show me the name column. All right. Now, if I get rid of this part here that is proxying the props, uh, let's just get rid of this as well. Ah, oh, that's still working. All right, to be honest, um, I thought that wouldn't work. Let's just shut down the server. So that's something that I need to do some research on. That's right, I like having new things to learn. Yeah, I thought that that would actually not make it invisible because you need to proxy the props. Anyway, yeah, you need to know this anyway because sometimes those props need to be proxied. Otherwise, um, something, uh, some functionality is going to be lost uh, inside of that cell. All right, moving on. Now what we can do is actually spit out the row here. So I'm gonna throw that in a pre-tag and just say props.row. All right, so notice now we have the access to the entire row. And now let's get rid of that and just change it to props.row.email. All right, so basically we've now replicated the functionality of the table cell, but now we have total control over it. So check it out. We can use the Q chip component, give it a color equal to primary, and then we can just pluck this out and throw it directly inside of that chip and now we've got it inside of a chip. And I believe we've got here text dash color, and we can set that equal to white. Um, or maybe just class is equal to text dash white. Is that it? Do I need to refresh the page? What's going on here? Yep, there we go. <laughs> so now you can just take total control over what all these different cells look like. And a pattern that people want to know all the time, so I'll quickly show you it in this video, is if you wanna update one of these cells, you can just put an input directly in there. So I'm gonna copy that and I'm gonna paste it directly in here. I'll just hide that out, display this a little bit nicer. And now I can come in here and say body cell email and change this to an input. Uh, not email, sorry, this is body cell name. So instead of a chip, let's say Q dash input. Ah, Q dash input. And then V dash model is equal to props.row dot um, name. All right, so now we actually have an input for that individual cell. And then we could say borderless, all right, that's gonna get rid of all of the border, border styling. All right, so we don't have that underline anymore. I might have to refresh the page. Yeah, sometimes HMR doesn't work um, currently with Vite. I'm sure that's gonna be fixed soon. All you do is refresh the page and everything works fine. So it's not a big deal. And the other thing is, notice that's taking up a little bit more space now. So you can say dense so that it takes up a little bit less space. There we go, kind of like um, makes it a bit smaller. And now this is an editable field. Now the reason that's not working is because uh, this is not a reactive ref. So I believe all I have to do 
And I could be wrong here, but I'm pretty sure I just need to turn that into a ref. Save it. Refresh the page. Let's see if that works now. Yeah, there we go. Now you can actually change that value. But as you can imagine, you'd probably be dealing with a back end and you'd say, hey, when this field changes, then go ahead and hit the back end. Um, give me a spinner as well. I'll quickly show you how to do that. Um, you'd say, for example, uh, loading. Loading on here is equal to true. And then that would obviously be modeling something to let us know whether or not it's hitting the back end. So notice we now get that spinner um, to let us know that it's loading. And then you might want to add some more styling on that. So you'd say like color is equal to primary. I mean, I could sit here all day showing you the, all the really cool stuff that we can do with this input. Uh, but we'll leave it at that for now. Um, and by the way, I wanted to, just wanted to point out a really interesting pattern with Quasar is that it always makes things really easy to do by default. So if you remember at the start of when we added this table in, all we had to do is literally add the rows and it just worked. That is all we did. However, you can extend things however you like. It is incredibly extendable. Now, another thing you might want to do uh, is have a form. So you can imagine you might have like a button at the top here that shows a dialog where you can then add a new user. So let me just quickly show you uh, what adding that functionality might look like. First, let's get rid of this spinner because it's going to drive you all insane. There we go. Let's get rid of that. So a common pattern would be jumping into the top here. Whoops. In fact, what I might do is get rid of um, all of this template just to bring us back to a simpler example. And there we go. So what we can do is we can say template. Um, oh. And we can say top, and that's going to allow us to access the top of the table. So there we are there. So now I can say Q dash button, and I'm going to make this button round, and I'm going to make it uh, unelevated. And let's give it a color equal to primary. All right. So actually, I could probably quickly show you what that does. Without round, it's square. Without un unelevated, it gives us this shadow. In fact, maybe we'll keep that shadow. That doesn't look too bad. And then the color sets it to primary, of course. And then you can say the icon is equal to, I think it's add or plus. Yeah, there we go. So now we've got like this cool plus button, which you can imagine is going to be for adding a new user. And then what we want to do is make it so that when you click on this, we get a new dialogue and that dialogue is going to have a form for creating a new user. So now we can come in and add a dialogue underneath this table, Q-dialog. And one thing I like to do is say that it's V-model is equal to show dialogue and then set this equal to, we say const show dialogue is equal to a ref that's equal to true by default. And I set it to true by default because it makes it easier to edit so that whenever I refresh the page, I don't lose that dialogue. I'll show you what I mean. So when I save it, we now have that dialogue. And of course, it looks like nothing by default, right? Quasar purposely makes the dialogue extremely, extremely minimal. And then we can basically start doing stuff like throwing in a card, q-card-section. And then at the top of the card, we might have a q-toolbar. This is going to be a great opportunity to show you some components, by the way. Um, Q dash toolbar dash title. And let's set the title of this toolbar equal to um, create user. All right. So let's lay that out a little bit nicer. So basically, we've got a, cool, a toolbar um, component, which adds this um, sort of space, nicely spaced out um, top of the toolbar. And then... We've got a Q toolbar title, which basically adds a little bit of styling in here. And then we can say Q dash button. And I want to make this flat. I want to give it an icon equal to close. And I want to say at uh, V dash close dash pop up. So this is a really cool directive that we get by default with Quasar that's going to automatically close the pop up that this button is inside of. All right, let's see what that looks like. There we go. When I click on this, it closes the pop up. How cool is that? Uh, another thing we'll do is we'll make this round and we'll set the size equal to small. I think that might be a bit nicer. Let's try that and see how it works. Oops, what have I done here? Yeah, there we go. That's probably a really nice um, close button. Now, for the card inside of here, I'm going to say the style is equal to max width and let's say 400, uh, I don't know, uh, 450 pixels. Save that, and then we'll say that the class is equal to full width. 
there we go. This is a pattern I like to use because it means that if it's um, let's let's just set this to something like 600. And what I like to do is say the max width is the optimal viewing width. All right. So if it gets a really big, it's not going to make the width of this card too big. But if we go smaller, it is going to get smaller because this is set to max width. All right, so this is a great, great pattern to know about for dialogues. Set it to full width for the card inside of it, and then set the max width to the quote-unquote optimal viewing width. That's how I like to think of it. All right, so this is starting to shape up nicely. Now we've got this cue card section in here, and then this is where you'd have your form. And usually I'd extract these to their own components, but you know how to do that now because we did that with the list for the left menu over here. So now I can say q-import... And let's just breeze through this. The label is equal to um, name. They're going to have a name and they're going to have an email. You wouldn't really do a password, I guess, when you're adding them in this scenario. And then underneath that card section, we'll say Q-button. And then we'll say the label is equal to create. Save it. And there we go. I also like to make this um, field. And let's put a class equal to q-margin-bottom-medium there. There we go. And this button, let's say the class is equal to full-width, and let's set the color equal to primary. There we go. So now we've got like a create user form. And then you can imagine when you click on that create button that it does something. So let's say our click is equal to create user. I'm going to scroll up to the top now and create that function, function, create user, and then you do whatever you need to do to create the user, and then you'd say that the show dialog is now equal to false. Once again, we're using the composition API, so whenever you're dealing with a ref, you have to say show dialog dot value to basically jump into the ref so, um, uh, to, to um, change the value inside of it. So let's save that, create, and imagine that I then created the user and then close that dialog. One last thing we need to do, this create button doesn't actually do anything. So let's come down here to that button. There it is there, the add button. And we can say, this is really simple, at click is equal to uh, create, what, what do we call it? Show dialog is equal to show dialog is equal to true. All right, so notice that we can actually put some functionality directly inside of the template here. So um, we don't have to create the function inside of here if it's something as simple as changing a value to true or false. All right, so when we click on here, it now shows that dialog. All right, cool stuff. Now, the last thing I wanna do is actually show you to how to model this form, because currently that's not modeling any data, so it doesn't work. So let's quickly run over that. Uh, we'll come in here and we'll say const uh, create user form. Once again, this would usually sit inside of its own component, and that's gonna be equal to ref, and let's say the email and then the name. Create user form. I'll come down here and then we'll say, wait, where are we? Here we go. V dash model is equal to create user form dot name and then create user form dot email. So let's save it. And now we've got that data um, being modeled so that we can actually deal with it when we're ready to go ahead and create that user. Um, in which case you would then hit your back end, the user would be created, and then you would go ahead and close that dialogue. So just to give you a little bit more of a fuller example here, let's scroll back up to that. Um, so this would probably be an async function. You'd probably say async, and then you'd have a function that creates the user, which would be a promise. So you could say await, create, user, and then, I don't know, maybe you're using Laravel, so create user with Laravel, and then you would go ahead and say show dialog that value is equal to false. Um, and usually you see patterns like this, where you pull out something like um, the error and then the response, or in this case, actually, you'd probably just pull out the error. And then you could say something like, if we get an error there, then you, know, you deal with the error, um, else, set show dialogue to false, all right? So just to kind of give you a basic idea of how you might handle the back end there. But, you know, of course I can't do the back end in this video because it, I want it to be a little bit more general. All right, so there we go. Uh, that's about it for that. The next thing we've got on the list, oh, by the way, let's set this equal to false by default. So now when I refresh the page, yeah. 
So that sort of gives you an idea of how you might start approaching building an admin panel. Um, let me show you a, a sort of quick example of how you might do the same concept using an inventory. This is kind of gonna drill some of the concepts that we've done home. So I'm gonna move a little bit faster now. Let's jump into main layout and we'll jump into our main layout menu list. And then inside of here, we've got users. Let's add another item in there. And as if you end up having a lot of items here, you'd probably model data instead and say, for example, V-4 is equal to item in items. In fact, let's actually go ahead and implement that. All right, and then you'd say the key is equal to something like item.label. And then the place that it's going to uh, will be item.2. And then I have to add the colon here to make sure that actually gets um, interpreted to make sure it gets run so it's not seen as a string. Um, uh, some beginners might not know that. If you don't have this colon here, that's gonna be seen as item.2 the string, but then you add the colon and that's the way of saying, um, hey view, I want you to bind this to item.2. So I want that to be, um, the value of that to be passed through to two. Uh, okay, so then we'll spit out here the label, item.label, save it. Of course, that's not gonna work because we haven't created any of our items yet. So now I can come up here and say const items is equal to an array. And the first one is gonna have a label equal to uh, users. And then two is going to be equal to slash users. And I think that's it, const, all right. Let's refresh the page here. And there we go. So we've basically got the same thing, but now we're modeling some data. And you know what? I wanna show you how I would actually do this to make this a little bit more realistic. So control shift P reveal to find that in the left menu. I'd actually create a new folder here called main layout. And then I go ahead and throw that main layout component in there. And I go ahead and throw the menu list, list in there. Um, and then I go ahead and create another file here called menu items.js. And I'd actually take all of these menu items and I'd throw them into this separate file here. Export default. Um, yeah, I'd probably just do that directly like that because I'm constantly, constantly, constantly trying to pull my components apart as much as I can. I don't think I've ever done too many abstractions in terms of pulling my components apart. You really do wanna keep them as in, like the smallest fragments as you can and makes it far easier to maintain. So now here, all I have to do is say menu items. So we'll pull that in. Oh, that didn't import. Import menu items from dot slash menu items, and then I'll copy that and come down here. Instead of item in items, we'll say item in menu items. All right, so let's refresh the page, see if we get any errors there. Looks like I have gotten some. Oh, I need to update my routes file because I just changed the structure here. So we go to routes.js and it's now layouts, main layouts slash main layout.view. Some people will use an index.view file. That's another way to do it. I actually like to just use the word main layout.view because it's easy to search. I can now say control P main layout and easily jump into it. And I can't do that as easily when it's index.view. That's why I like to name them very specifically. Um, that's only a source maps error, so I'm fine with that. And there we go. Now in order to add a new menu item, I can jump in here and say, hey, I now wanna have a new menu item. And by the way, this is easier for other developers in the future when you do it this way. And we'll call this inventory and we'll say inventory. So come up here, inventory. Now we've got our inventory page, which of course doesn't exist yet. Control and we'll open up this uh, menu here. Quasar, new page, invent, oh God, I need to spell this right. In inventory page, there we go. And now we go to routes.js and we've got our users page. And by the way, I'd probably start extracting um, routes into their own files now, because this is also starting to get a bit bloated for me, um, but I won't do that right now. And we'll call this inventory, and we want to point that to inventory page. Save it. And now we should have an inventory page, inventory page. Once again, like I like to name things very specifically. So inventory, I can just type in control P inventory and easily jump over to that file. Um, I'm just gonna replace this with my own template. 
and then change that back to a Q-Page. By the way, cool thing to know about Q-Page, this is a really handy thing to know about Q-Page. Um, notice that Q-Page is actually taking up the entire size of the frame here. Um, so if I go, if I bring the scroll bar to the top, it's still only taking up this section here. And if I go right to the bottom, see how the minimum height of the page is changing? This is actually insanely helpful because if you need things to be contained within this page, so for example, if you want your own scroll bar on the right side there, rather than scrolling down the page and then having the menu disappear and the you know, menu on the left here disappear, um, since this is um, manually sized, like the page on its own, it means that you can do some really interesting layouts. Um, those of you that are a bit more advanced know what I mean by that. I won't um, expand on that anymore because it's probably jumping into a... <laughs> a too advanced zone. All right, so what am I doing now? I'm doing an inventory page with some cards. So we've got this inventory page. Uh, what is a card going to have? We're probably going to want it to have an image. So let's say inventory here. And of course, you can imagine this is coming from a back end. Let's say the label of this card is equal to, um, I don't know, pants. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll call them like spicy pants. Um, what else? I guess you give it an ID as well because it's probably coming from a back end. Uh, we'll give it a description. And they say, look great in any era. And then I want to have an image for this as well. So I get to use Quasar's image component. Image source. By the way, some people like to use shorthand, shorthand like IMG. I hate doing that. There are some exceptions like ID for identification because they're so obvious, but I usually like to just write out the whole word. For some reason, that's a pet hate of mine, but you know, everybody knows what IMG is, I guess, so that's a bad example, but I try not to um, shorten words too much because it makes it harder for other people to understand my code, um, especially when I'm doing loops. I never use things like I or E or X in a loop unless it's um, a very like um, technical type of loop. All right, so moving on here, I'm going to say HTTPS dot dot slash slash, uh, I need that to be a string. Pick some dot photos. This is a great way to just get a random photo. Let's set the width to maybe 600 by 200. That'll do for now. And let's just get that first inventory item spat out. All right, so now we can say Q dash card. Q dash card. Man, my arm. Um, IDE isn't playing nice with me today, Q dash card. And then we'll have the image at the top. So we can say V dash four is equal to card in uh, inventory. And then we can say the key, because you always need to have a key when you're going doing a V4 is equal to card dot ID. All right, there we go. And then inside of there, we're going to have the image of the thing. So for that, we can do a Q dash image component. And we can say the source of that image is going to be equal to the image source. So now I can say card dot image source. By the way, I named this very badly. Card is a bad name. Um, I would say something like um, uh, item, because it's, an, it's an item in an inventory. So let's refresh that. What's gone wrong here? And there we go, it's loading up that image and that seems to be working nicely. So the next thing I wanna do is add some padding to this page. Padding, so that adds just a little bit of padding. That's kind of like Quasar's default padding. Um, and now let's go ahead and just add uh, a few more of these cards. Uh, before we do that, actually, let's set a max width on this. So style is equal to max dash width. And I think, a, oh, what's going on? W-I-D-T-H. I think my uh, T key is messed up a little bit. We'll set that to maybe like 300 pixels. How's that? Let's see how that looks. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good width for the card, but I think it's probably needs to be a little bit higher, maybe like 380. Yeah, that's a bit better. And let's, can we say width and height for that image? Can we say like, um, the width is known, let's say 600, and the height is equal to 380. Yeah, that means when it's loading, it's going to be a little bit more specific. I think that works. Oh, oh it, does it need to be interpreted? It doesn't really matter, I guess. Yeah, let's leave it like that. What's going on here? Invalid prop, type check prop. Okay, it, expe it expects a string there. Um, so maybe we'll change that to pixels as well. 
Oh gosh, I've been going for a while now, so I do want to finish up soon. Oh, is it really that much? Oh, could we set this to 300? Okay, we'll set that to 300 width and let's set the height to maybe 180. And then we'll come in here. We might as well get one that's 300 by 180. Sorry, this is finicky stuff. Yeah, there we go. It just means when it's loading, it's already the correct height. And that's our first card. Now, the next thing you'll probably want to do... Uh, oh, by the way, you probably want some categories as well. Categories equal to um, pants and clothes. Categories. Oh, categories. There we go. So the first thing I want to do is add some chips here for the categories. So I want to add underneath this image a Q-card-section. And oh man, for some reason, let me just restart Vola. Because for some reason, when I do my components, it's not automatically... There we go, it's working now. I had to just restart Vola. Uh, and then we'll say Q dash. Uh, we'll, we'll add some chips in there. So we'll say um, Q dash chip. And we'll say V dash 4 is equal to chip in chips. And then the key is equal to, let's say chip.id. And we'll actually add some more information to these chips. So how about we give the category R name and then we'll also give it a color so primary or how about we say like um i don't know green and then we'll make this other one which is called clothes we'll make it blue all right make sure we get the comma in there and we can say feed us for uh category in item dot categories. All right, there we go. So now we've got the category ID and then we can say the color is equal to the category dot color. Cool, we got those chips showing up now. Um, what do we call this? We call this the name of the chip. So now we can come in here and say the label is equal to category dot label. Yeah. Is it label? Once again, back to the trusty API Explorer. Q chip. Open it up. Content. We got icons. Um, we got label. L A B E L. Category. Oh, that's right. I called it name. My bad. And now we can say text dash color, I think, and then say white there. Now let's refresh the page. There we go. So now we've got some chips showing what category they're in. Now this card section is adding too much padding for my tasting. For my taste. So let's say class is equal to Q dash padding or and we'll just make it a smaller amount of padding. There we go. I think that looks a bit nicer. And then you want the name of the thing. I probably want that before the chips. Yeah, I reckon you want it before the chips. So let's come up um, before them and we'll give it its own div and we'll say item dot da, what do we call it? Label. Save it. Spicy pants, of course, that needs to be a little bit bigger. We might even turn this into a H, I don't know, five maybe. Spicy pants, I think that's a good um, text size. And now we can say class is equal to Q dash margin Y. So margins on the Y axis is going to equal none. So it gets rid of that Y axis margin. Um, and I might just change that to margin bottom none. And then I can say Q dash margin top small. Yeah, that looks good. Q dash margin left, uh, or maybe small as well. Small or medium? Medium, maybe. Yeah, I think small looks better. There we go. And now, one thing that I like to do, I get a bit obsessed over this, is say text dash color, no, sorry, text dash gray dash nine. And it just softens the text a little bit, which I think is a little bit nicer to read. And then we want the description sitting underneath it. So we'll come down here and we'll say div. And this is going to be the description. I like to give them all their own separate divs. It just makes me feel like I've got a little bit more control. Category dot, oh, sorry, not category. This is going to be the item. Item dot, whoops, description. There we go. That doesn't look quite right, does it? It needs to have its own padding. Class is equal to Q dash padding or medium. And there we go. That's the description of the thing. Uh, I don't know if I like padding or medium. Maybe padding X medium. 
yeah and then we could say q dash padding bottom small you can kind of like style this however you like mm. yeah so really we want just yeah i think that looks good i think i want these though to be next to the title yeah let's try that i think that might look a little bit nicer so let's throw them in there and how does that look yeah I think that looks a little bit better. And now maybe we can justify using a cue card section here. Now that it's spaced it out a little bit. Yeah, okay. This looks good to me. And now we'll add a little bit of more margin on the left there. Margin left small will become large and left medium. And I think this looks really nice. Okay, just because I'm being super pedantic, let's come in here and make that dense. No, dense is too dense. Change my mind. Uh, what about small? Size is equal to small instead of dense. Yeah, okay, I think that looks pretty good. So there you go. That's the idea of how you might do a card for like an inventory list. And if you want to make this clickable, you could say, for example, um, class is equal to, I think it's cursor pointer or mouse pointer. Ah, I can't remember. Let's come in here and say pointer. The docs are, have really good searching functionality, by the way. They do a really good do job hitting all different parts of the docs. Here we go. Style and identity. No, I don't think that's it. It's under like um, helper classes. It's a helper class. So let's say helper. Cursor pointer. That's what it is. So what I can do is say, hey, this card is clickable because you might want to make it so that when you click on that card, something happens. And there we go. Now I just get like a nice sort of unclicking button. And it might open up a dialog where you can then edit the card for that uh, inventory item. And then, of course, you can imagine that you would have a bunch of these. And the next thing you might be interested in is layout for that. And I don't think there's actually anything we need to do for the layout. So let's just paste a bunch of these down. And we'll have to change the IDs for all of them. One, two three four let's try that all right so that layout doesn't look great does it so let's have a look at how we might improve the layout for this uh first thing i'm thinking i want this page to be a row all right so next thing i'm thinking is i want everything to be centered so we can say justify center there and now next i'm thinking i want to have some gaps between all of these items and i think i can easily do that with um well first let's wrap the card inside of a div Control shift enter there's a hot key for that i can't remember what it is sorry but it's a really quick way to sort of wrap everything um all right so now we can say that this has got a class equal to q this is a quick and easy way to do it actually q dash padding or medium i could just do that couldn't i no sorry q dash margin or medium and then no, no, you want the margin to be on the card this stuff often confuses me q dash margin or medium and then that's a row maybe these have to be set up as a col class is equal to what am i doing wrong here this is a row Ah, okay, I reckon these divs are taking up the entire space. So let's take that style tag out of there. Because I don't think I actually need this class in here. Hmm, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. So this should be a row. It is a row. And... My voice is low. By that, do you mean you can't hear me very well? Uh, you can use Q gutter instead of Q marginal. Yes, Q gutter is nice. Um, both of those options are available. In fact, Q gutter is probably a better option if you have a more thorough understanding of Quasar. Um, the reason I don't use it all of the time is because sometimes it runs into problems when you're using like m your own margining and padding, and you have to do like some some nesting and stuff like that. However, I will admit that QGuard is a much nicer way to do it um, 
if you do handle those kind of edge cases. In fact, I think you're right. We probably should use QGutter here. Uh, but first, I want to figure out why I can't get these rows working. I don't want to sit on this for too long, though. What am I missing here? You know what? Let's go to the Quasar docs and just look at the part around layout. See, I still get this stuff wrong all the time. Sorry, not layout. This is around grid. Yeah, so you make a row and then you just throw your divs in there. So maybe there's something weird that I'm doing. I don't know. If anybody can catch what I've done wrong here, then please let me know. I'm getting a little bit tired, so I don't think I can go on for much longer. Um, what happens if I get rid of justify center there? That margining is now messing with um, the width. Um, I'm going to change this to a column. Class is equal to col for column. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to take a break now. I mean, my brain is just shutting down. Um, I, had, I don't get it. It's a row. No way column should work there. So what else could I possibly be doing wrong? What else is sitting underneath here? Ah, oh, of course. So I'm iterating over all of the cards inside of this div. Oh gosh, that's so silly of me. And there we go. So that is now working. And now it looks like it does make sense to maybe not set a width and height on that. So it's not enforced. And now we want to set a min width on these. So what did I say? Max width. Um, so another thing I like to do is set a min dash width. Yeah, all right. I'm going to stop after this. Let's set it to maybe um, 300 pixels as well. And then maybe we could bump that up to like 450 pixels. Yeah. All right. That looks pretty good. And that's going to spawn, respond really nicely as well. It's going to be very responsive on just about any screen size. Yeah. You know, actually, honestly, for something like this, I'd probably just set a width. So like width is equal to, I don't know, 450 pixels. Oh, all right. So that didn't work. Looks like you need to set both of these. All right, that'll do me for now. <laughs> so anyway, we covered quite a bit of cool stuff. We've got a users table now. We can go ahead and create a user. Um, you know, this is all obviously just um, UI stuff, inventory. We've got our login page. And I just wanted to give people an idea of how you might get up and running um, with uh, the, you know, modern Qu Quasar Vite CLI. And what else? So another cool... Th Another sort of set of things that I want to cover is the splitter component. I won't do this right now. Proxying data using USB model. This is a really nice pattern um, for basically allowing you to wrap components. And then we're going to talk about sort of advanced wrapping of components to make it really easy for you to extract data. And then I wanted to talk about some of the stuff I'm working on right now. But we'll save that for another time.
Thanks everyone for watching and I'll see you in the next stream. Bye for now.